thanks for, for introducing the sort of switch to circuits and, and throwing up some of the things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm really going to be talking about the work from our group on uh, many body quantum optics, many body circuit QED. Uh, this is sort of run with a, a handful of theory collaborators and a bunch of folks from my group. At the moment, uh, this whole set of, of projects is, is really being driven by Alicia and Matthias, who are both here and giving a poster, and so you can come uh, and hunt them down for more details at the, at the reception tomorrow night. Um, OK, so we're really, uh, we're really sort of trying to harness uh, the things that have been generated in circuit QED, where you use superconducting circuits to do cavity QED uh, in order to go beyond uh, sort of single cavity, single atom physics, and to ask sort of the ways in which we can introduce sort of manyness to the system. Uh, to do that, we're going to take advantage of, of the kinds of things that we get from our circuits, right? So one thing we really like is we get just incredibly strong coupling. The effective photon-photons interactions that you get mediated by this qubit can be three-ish or more orders of magnitude larger than any of the decay rates in the problem, right? Uh, and so you can get sort of arbitrarily large interactions uh, to a first approximation. Uh, also, everything we make is lithographically defined. So if we want to have two cavities, it's kind of you just draw two of them next to each other. And if we want to have things that are not uh, simple lattices, we just draw all funny little pictures. Uh, and basically, if you can draw it, we can build it. Uh, the price we pay for that power is that our things are lithographically defined. And so when we draw a little atom there, it is an atom that is not the same as every other atom in the universe. But in fact, it's an atom that has a little bit of spread in the frequency. And so uh, we have a little bit of penalty that we pay uh, in the disorder of our atoms. Uh, but, uh, but as a result, we get very, very strong interactions and the ability to lithographically define all kinds of complicated structures. And I want to sort of give an overview of the different types of work our group has been doing to explore this, uh, looking at manyness in a couple different ways. And so uh, I'll start with this sort of experiment, which is now two or three years old, uh, where we look at a James Cummings dimer uh, and look at, uh, look at dynamical phase transitions uh, here uh, with a lot of photons, so, so two lattice lights, but a lot of photons. Uh, then we'll sort of jump into some steady state phase transitions, looking at 72 cavities uh, coupled in a 1D chain. Uh, we'll look at some 2D pictures and some of the, the crazier 2D lattices we've been dreaming up. Uh, at the same time, you don't have to build spatially separate lattices, but you can build multi-mode cavities uh, a la Ben just by building big, long things. Uh, and finally, uh, some of the stuff with these photonic band gap crystals, which give us a new tool for building up uh, interesting many-body uh, cavities-based systems. Okay. So starting with the dimer, uh, you know, we're, we're really going to be sort of jumping a little bit back and forth between these ideas of dynamical phase transitions, where we look at sort of dramatic changes in the system parameters, and a steady state or dissipative phase transition, where you drive the system sort of at one point and look at sort of where all the photons are and look for sort of a change in the steady state of a system. Both are non-equilibrium. Uh, as Ben highlighted this morning, one of the real assets of this cavity QED sort of many-body world is we really have a good lens on non-equilibrium processes. Uh, and, and these are sort of two of the different types of non-equilibrium processes we can look at. Okay, so the dimer. You know, uh, I'm not going to talk at all about single cavities. You know, you, you have a single cavity, you put a qubit in, you get a vacuum Robbie crossing, it's really big. Uh, you, you, you can get effective photon-photon interactions mediated by the qubit. So the question is now, where do you build up from there? And that's, I think, the place I want to start from. So the simplest thing that you could build if you want to sort of start exploring this, this world of physics is to build two, because two is the, the, the lowest number I can think of that's bigger than one. Uh, and uh, so you put two cavities there, uh, and you couple them. So you, 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 uh, you have a partially silvered mirror, so all the photons that leave one cavity find themselves in yet another cavity. Um, you put an atom in each cavity, which makes strong interactions, and now you actually wind up with a, a, a competition already. Uh, so this hopping term makes photons want to delocalize. Photons don't want to hang out of one cavity if the normal modes of the system are, are superpositions of these two cavity modes. So if you put a bunch of photons here, they'll sort of slosh back and forth and back and forth. But when you turn on interactions, then, uh, then that sort of makes it hard for these photons to actually move back and forth, and so that sort of forces them to want to stay in one cavity or another. Now, if you change uh, the, either the strength of the interactions or the strength of this hopping term, then you can sort of force sort of a transition from sort of a localized to a delocalized state. Um, there are two ways in which we can turn interactions on and off in the system. So first, each of these qubits actually has a, a little squid loop on it, so it can be tuned in frequency, and so we can bring them into and out of resonance with our cavities. And so we move them very far away. It's kind of like they're not there. 
Uh, we can also change the effect of photon-photon interactions by increasing the number of photons in the system. So what we're thinking of as a photon-photon interaction actually has the form of square root of n minus square root of n minus 1. It comes from the a's and a daggers. Uh, and so as you add more and more photons, the sort of extra energy you pay to add one additional photon sort of beyond h bar omega goes down. And so as you put more and more photons in the system, it sort of acts more and more uh, like a non-interacting system. Uh, and so that's actually what we're going to wind up tuning as our knob here. For the most part, uh, we're going to initialize the system uh, by pumping all the photons into one of the two cavities. We do this by driving each cavity with a sort of fixed phase relationship. Uh, we do this when there are absolutely no interactions with the qubits detuned. Uh, at a time t equals zero, we bring the qubits into resonance with both of the cavities, essentially instantaneously, uh, thus turning on interactions. Uh, if we do this with a relatively small number of photons in the cavity, then essentially our photons are localized. They're going to stick around and hang out in whatever cavity they were in to start with. If we have a large number of photons, then they're going to swamp out the nonlinearity of the system. And so photons are going to slosh back and forth between the two cavities and slowly leak out of the system. But of course, as the number of photons in the system decreases as they leak out, uh, the interactions are effectively getting larger. And at some point, we cross back over this threshold. Uh, and the, system, the photons will then lock in place in one of the two cavities. So we do this uh, by building a, a, a system that looks like this. So here is one cavity. And you can see, in order to make our partially silvered mirror, we just build a little capacitor in the middle. We kind of just forget a little section of metal uh, in, this, in this transmission line. So here's one cavity. Here's a second cavity. There's a qubit in each with a little line that allows us to sort of control the, the qubit frequencies. Uh, and we do this. The data looks like this. Uh, and so we initialize. And you can see now we're monitoring the homodyne voltage in one of the two cavities. So we're sort of monitoring A in, in one of the cavities. And you can see if we do that, uh, during this initialization phase, you actually have photons that are sort of sloshing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between the cavities. And then when you turn on the interactions, if things are small, you see, uh, which actually tends to be some very fast oscillations, which I'll explain in a second, uh, if, the, if the number of photons is large, you see uh, oscillations back and forth and back and forth until you sort of abruptly hit this point uh, where they wind up localizing. So what's going on here? If we look at this sort of... Uh, Ah, if we look at this point down, don't go there. Uh, if we look at this uh, point down here, uh, these these fast oscillations are actually just the collapse in revivals, right? So we've now we have uh, we load this with a coherent state of photons. Uh, there's one atom inside of a cavity, and because they're localized, it's, it's, it's as if the other cavity doesn't exist. And so the, the physics you see is just collapse in revival physics. Uh, you can measure the revival time; it goes as the square root of the photon number, like you expect, uh, and it's it's essentially single cavity QED physics. Uh, if we wait and don't turn on our interactions at t equals zero, you can see, you know, uh, if we vary like what comes out of the left cavity or what comes out of the right cavity, we can see sort of collapse and revivals in the left cavity if all the photons are there. But if we wait half a period so that all the photons have sloshed over to the right cavity, then we see collapse and revivals over there and nothing coming out over here because the photons are just localized to one of the two cavities. Um, whereas if we look up here in this sort of delocalized region, we see uh, we see nice oscillations up until you cross exactly the same uh, threshold where the interactions get strong. And then uh, if, you, if you never turn interactions on, these oscillations continue down decaying forever. But as soon as you cross this threshold number of photons uh, in the interacting case, you, your, your homodyne voltage essentially drops out. And that's because uh, you actually have a critical slowing down as you approach this sort of critical number of photons. And so the phase of, of the homodyne signal when you localize is actually random. And so you actually just see an abrupt decay of the homodyne voltage. And so you can sort of see that as dissipation drives the number of photons down, it's actually driving the interaction strength up. Uh, and it's driving you from a delocalized into a localized state. We're particularly interested, though, in moving into understanding steady state phase transitions. One reason is, is, uh, is just that photons seem like such a powerful tool for that, because it's absolutely trivial for us to add more photons to the system. right? We just sort of continually drive this thing, uh, and we measure sort of the steady state response of the system. Uh, and, and so for instance, one thing you can do is you can actually measure the current flowing back and forth between these two cavities. Uh, we have a device that allows us to do this while actually tuning the interaction rate. Uh, and this is something that's sort of currently in progress. And you can see some about the progress on Matthias and Alicia's poster. And so I will leave it there.
uh, so that they can answer all your questions about where this is going. Because in the meantime, we've sort of gone away from the dimer and started looking at steady state phase transitions, not in a two lattice site thing, but in a lot of them. Because you know, if you can build two, you can kind of build 72. Uh, and so, uh, so the goal here is really now to start to look at steady state phase transitions and to try and make a map uh, of steady state or dissipative phase transitions, uh, sort of think, starting our thinking in this world of quantum phase transitions. I've stolen this, this table, which I think is fantastic, from this Kessler paper uh, from the Lucan group. Uh, and so if you're sort of used to thinking about quantum phase transitions, you have an energy gap and you have a zero state, which is the lowest energy state, and you get a phase transition when the gap closes. In a, in a steady state or a, a driven dissipative system, you now don't have a Hamiltonian to describe it, but you can write down a Lavillian, uh, and you can define this asymptotic decay rate, which is you know, uh, the sort of steady states of the Lavillian, and, it's the, uh, and you can define sort of the equivalent of a gap, uh, which is, uh, and you get a sort of phase transition with this asymptotic decay rate, the sort of real part of this eigenvalue uh, of this, of this uh, Lavillian goes to zero. Uh, and that's sort of essentially when the thing that you stay in in steady state uh, changes abruptly. And so this is, this is really what we're going to look for, sort of an abrupt change in the behavior of the system, the sort of steady state behavior of the system. And then we're going to extract this asymptotic decay rate essentially from the switching rates in the system uh, as we sort of cross over this phase boundary. Uh, so the device looks like this. Uh, it is, it is, uh, this is a larger chip than our normal chips so that we can fit 72 cavities on there. So this is actually five millimeters. So this is just uh, 72 uh, half wavelength resonators all in a row. Uh, at the endpoint of each one, there's a little capacitor, which makes the output of one coupled to the input of the other. So that if you drive this system from one end, photons can only make it through by hopping from cavity to cavity to cavity to cavity to cavity, to cavity all the way through to the end. And in each, Q and in each cavity, we place a qubit, uh, and the qubit gives us strong photon-photon interactions. These qubits are not all resonant, and because they are not all resonant, there is some spread in the effective photon interaction rates uh, at, uh, at each lattice site, and we do not individually control the frequency. So this is one place where if we just had like one rubidium atom happily sitting in each cavity, we would be thrilled because they'd all be the same, but they're not. Uh, but it still is, is, is enough that we, because the interactions are so very strong, even if they're off resonant, the effective interactions uh, are still quite strong. And so we can still uh, start to see some sort of emergent many body physics. Uh, and so this is what transmission through the system looks like. Uh, at, low, uh, at low drive power down here at the bottom, uh, you essentially can get uh, you know, at very low drive power, you get sort of linear response because you always do. Uh, as you try and increase the power, you get what, what essentially is a photon blockade. So you can't get uh, more than a photon in at a time. Uh, and then abruptly, uh, the behavior of the system changes across this boundary up here uh, where we, we get extraordinarily low transmission all of a sudden. And we wind up scattering photons out of the sort of drive frequency into sort of all manner of, of different modes of the system. Uh, and so here's sort of a power spectrum showing, you know, uh, w w at this sort of low power limit, we are we are blockaded, but we we keep uh, we keep sort of a linear response, and then we sort of spread out the emission spectrum sort of broadly over this this uh, this sort of band as we go above some threshold. Uh, as you drive up and down across the threshold, it takes some time for the system to change from one thing to the other. Uh, and you can actually sort of move up and down and up and down and up and down uh, and map out this hysteresis region uh, and use that essentially to extract the, the imaginary part of, uh, uh, the real part of the imaginary part of the, of the eigenstates of the Lavillian. And from that, you can sort of reconstruct this asymptotic decay rate. And so what you expect is sort of the real part of this eigenvalue of this Lavillian to go to zero. Uh, and so we will sort of drive back and forth across this uh, and essentially measure <coughs> a rate of decay from sort of one of these systems to the other as we sort of move across this, uh, abruptly move across this boundary. Uh, and as you do that, 
you can measure essentially a decay time uh, that, that, that gets incredibly long. It gets into the order of seconds, uh, which maps onto an asymptotic decay rate that, that gets down to uh, about 10 hertz, uh, which is much, much less than any of the decay rates of the system. We sort of made the decay rates of the system relatively large and so that we could sort of look for sort of slow, uh, critical slowing down type effects uh, around this boundary. And so it really does look like we're seeing what, what looks like a, a dissipative phase transition uh, here at the boundary. Okay. Uh, 1D lattices are great, but of course, uh, there, there's a limit to, to what you can do in a 1D lattice. Uh, it, it's kind of, there's not, a lot of uh, there's not a lot of creativity in what kind of lattice you draw. Uh, and so we've been thinking a lot about uh, what are interesting 2D lattices and what are tools we can use to understand these lattices. Uh, and so this is sort of the most natural thing that you can draw uh, with, these, with these cavities uh, is, is this lattice here. Uh, it has sort of hexagons of resonators uh, that all sort of have three resonators coming together at the endpoints. If you look at this naively, you think this is like photon graphene uh, because there are hexagons. This is actually uh, not photon graphene because each of the long skinny things is a lattice site and each of the points is actually where the bonds happen. So this is actually a Kagame lattice. Um, and so. Uh, this is sort of our favorite lattice because if three things come together, it's easy to make them all couple, uh, couple symmetrically. Uh, and so you can sort of uh, easily build a, you know, 200 cavity lattice uh, like this. Um, one thing that we started as we started thinking about 2D lattices is that, you know, just having sort of transmission measurements where you sort of pump one end and look at what comes out the other, that tells you a little bit about the, the energy levels of the system and the decay rates of the system uh, and the dynamics of the system, but it doesn't really tell you about spatially what's going on. Uh, and so we wanted to be able to get spatial information about the, where the photons lie. Uh, and so we built a scanned probe tool to actually start to probe these things and be able to measure locally where photons live in these lattices. Uh, and so uh, the idea here, there, there's sort of two versions of our, of our little photon microscope. One is, is a scanned <laughs> defect microscope. <coughs> uh, and so here, what we do is we take a little piece of sapphire and we locally sort of move it around with a, with a scan probe stage above the lattice sites. If it hovers above a lattice site, then it locally changes the dielectric of that, uh, uh, dielectric constant seen by the photons there, which makes the cavity look just a little bit uh, different in frequency. Uh, and it can be, in fact, different enough in frequency that as we pull this probe back uh, into and out of the plane here, so as we sort of approach the lattice, uh, what you see is that sort of the, the peaks you see either move, like this guy over here moves a lot, uh, or they move a little bit, like this guy over here, or some of them don't move at all. And so by looking at, uh, by measuring transmission through the lattice as a function of how much you perturb any lattice site, you can actually extract were photons going through that lattice site. Uh, and from there, you can build maps like this one. So this is a 49 cavity Kagame lattice where we're driving the system and we're moving a piece of sapphire around uh, from, uh, from theory. Uh, Jens's group uh, did some calculations and can say, here's what you expect the, the, the normal mode weight to be at the 36th mode of the system. Uh, and then if we use our scan probe tool, the outer color is in fact what we, we extract from the, the normal mode weights of the system. And so we can actually draw pictures of where the photons are hanging out uh, in the system. We've also shown that you can drag around not just a piece of sapphire, but you can drag around a transmon qubit, and you can strongly couple a transmon qubit on a stick to any of the lattice sites. And so in principle, that lets you do photon number measurements as well, uh, though, though we sort of have mostly been doing these with the, with the big lattices. From here, the question is, what's, what's a good, fun, interesting lattice to study? And this is where having, having a, a, a smart and slightly crazy postdoc uh, is, is always good. Uh, and so, uh, so one thing that we've been thinking about is uh, lattices in curved space, right? So the Kagame lattice, where three resonators come together, is great. Uh, but what if three resonators came together and instead of having hexagons, you had heptagons or octagons or nonagons, right? So this is all lithographically defined. And so it doesn't matter that this is not, you know, translationally invariant. We can lay out a, a, a lattice in curved space where you have n-gons tiled where three of them come together at any given point. And so this is sort of what you would draw with resonators. Uh, this is actually the, the sort of map of the connectivity map where the points are the, the lattices and this is what connects to what. <coughs> you can now, you know, go from, from this sort of pretty picture 
to uh, this version, which is actually laid out with circuits. Uh, so this is a cavity, uh, cavity version of it. So you can see a central heptagon uh, and then sort of heptagons radiating out. You have to be a little bit careful to make sure you keep uh, keep all of the lengths of these things constants so that you don't introduce disorder, but we can build these n-gon lattices uh, essentially in curved space and start to ask what happens both with, and it, it turns out there's actually interesting questions in these things without interactions. And so uh, we've been talking to some folks in the math department who found lots of interesting properties of these. Uh, so just to give you a taste of those kinds of things, but uh, Alicia can tell you more about it from her poster, uh, you, you see, uh, all of these things, like the Kagame lattice, have a flat band. Uh, and so sort of here's a picture of a localized flat band state, and here's sort of some other state in this, in this lattice. And so these things are all have a flat band. Uh, so any n-gon that we've, we've done so far has a, has a flat band. But it turns out that you know, in the Kagame lattice, the flat band touches the other bands of the system. So it's, it's not gapped. Uh, it turns out that if you have odd n-gons, then that lattice is gapped. Uh, and so, uh, and, and you know, it also can't be sort of localized around a single n-gon. So somehow having to be localized around multiple n-gons leads to it being a gapped lattice with a flat band, which is, which is sort of interesting. Uh, these are the kinds of questions we're starting to probe with this lattice. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, she can tell you more about, about where that's going, uh, but that's, that's certainly stuff that's in progress. Okay, so. So far, I've, I've talked mostly about lattices that we make by, uh, by, by physically creating each mode uh, as, a, as a, essentially a carbon copy of one cavity, right? So we have one cavity, it has a frequency, and we made two of them, or we made 72 of them, or we made a Kagame lattice of them, or we made a sort of hyperbolic lattice of them. Uh, we can also create lots of modes in other ways. And so one way is to, to take a page from Ben's book and say, let's make multi-modes. So let's make one cavity that has lots of modes and see the kinds of physics that we can see as the modes act in sort of interesting collective ways. But they're all modes of one sort of single cavity. Um, this sort of is an interesting direction to go because you can get into this interesting uh, multi-mode strong coupling regime. Uh, and it's, it's not quite as strong as ultra strong, but it's, you know, less, it's stronger than strong. It's like super strong or kind of ultra strong. I don't know what's the right word. Whatever, whatever is somewhere between ultra strong and strong, that's what this is. Um, so, <coughs> so the idea here is uh, if you have a, a cavity and you work with the fundamental mode, you have some coupling rate G, which we can make a couple hundred megahertz uh, and a frequency of like six or seven gigahertz. If you want to get, uh, get the coupling stronger compared to the fundamental mode, if you make this thing bigger, then you win, right? So if you make the cavity longer, the fundamental frequency goes down as the length of the cavity, but the coupling strength goes down as one over the square root of the length, because the mode volume squares as the length in these, in these superconducting cavities, uh, and therefore the sort of field goes as one over the square root of the length. So if you're going to compare G to your free spectral range, uh, you actually win as you make these things longer and longer and longer. Uh, and if you make them sufficiently long, then you can get a G that is bigger than or comparable to your free spectral range, which means that your sort of atom wants to absorb a photon before sort of one round trip transit time for a photon in the cavity, which gets to be sort of an interesting region because then the qubit essentially couples all the modes and you get lots of uh, sort of emergent collective action. Uh, it turns out if you do the calculation, the length, uh, the length where it really becomes interesting, you know, it starts to become interesting if you can make a cavity that's like half a meter long, and it really gets interesting if you can make a cavity that's like two meters long, which sounds crazy, uh, but I didn't tell my student that. I, another, another trick I learned from Ben, I said, just why don't you try this out? Uh, and so uh, my student Nirja made a cavity that is, uh, this one is 70 centimeters long, 68 centimeters long, uh, and it's basically just one transmission line, which is sort of curled up around a chip uh, with sort of capacitors at either end. So this is just a fabry perot cavity that's sort of curled around uh, in order to make it fit on a relatively small chip. And then hanging out sort of at one end at a voltage uh, antinode of all of the different modes is one atom, which couples strongly to all of the modes of the system. And so then we can say, well, let's look for our vacuum Rabi crossings. And so here you go. Uh, we tune our, our, you know, we have now it's a fabry perot cavity, so you have lots of modes. We have our qubits maximum frequency here, and we use a magnetic field to sort of tune it down and down and down. Uh, and you can see sort of lots of avoided crossings, and every avoided crossing kind of spills into the next avoided crossing. 
So if you sort of work down at relatively low frequencies, the avoided crossings are smaller. As you get to higher frequencies, uh, the avoided crossings are bigger. And here uh, we have a G, uh, a G at this point that's about 30 or 40 megahertz and, and a free spectral range that's 90 megahertz. So we have G that's sort of of the same order of the free spectral range, which is enough to actually get the sort of strong coupling of all of the modes. Uh, so one thing we can do is we can just drive it at some particular mode. I think uh, this is the 75th mode uh, that we are driving the system at. And as you drive it at the 75th mode, you see photons come out at all of the other modes of the system, uh, which, is, which is maybe not surprising, but kind of fun. Um, what's particularly a little bit more surprising is if you drive it a little bit off resonance with a mode, so you're not driving on any particular mode, uh, then uh, as you drive it, you wind up actually getting a spontaneous emission, which, is, uh, w which you can show comes from sort of the collective action of all of these dress states. And so you get this sort of uh, spontaneously generated coherence. And so although the line widths of the system are all pretty large, uh, they're, they're on the order of uh, a, a couple of megahertz. Uh, we, see, uh, we see at some point emission that is on the order of uh, a few tens of kilohertz. And so this comes from the fact that this emission is actually coming from lots of different modes of the system sort of acting in concert to sort of generate a much sharper uh, emission line than you could get from any one mode acting alone. Uh, and it's about, 50, it's about 25 times narrower than any uh, any single mode that you can get. And so you can start to see sort of all of these modes acting in concert uh, in some particular way. Um, I told her that I wasn't really happy that G over the free spectral range was only a third. Uh, and so she made a bigger one. This one, I think, is, is two or three meters long. Uh, and so here now, you actually get, uh, you get G truly bigger than the free spectral range. Uh, uh, and this is the device we're, we're working with now. So this is uh, a G, again, of about 40 megahertz, but a free spectral range of about 30 megahertz. Uh, and so we can get really, really far into this, this sort of twisting and torturing where photons go. Okay. <laughs> One last way that we can start to look at many modes and many, what am I doing on time? Oh, I got lots of time. Uh, one, one other interesting way that we can start to look at modes uh, acting, uh, many bodies things or many cavities acting together is now to couple to sort of the many electromagnetic modes of a, a more continuous spectrum, uh, which we make a little more manageable by, by creating a 1D uh, photonic band gap. So this idea of, of waveguide QED sort of has been around for a while, and, and it's something that Jeff Kimball uh, has been pushing very strongly uh, with, with these sort of alligatory things. Um, and so the idea here, uh, uh, this actually started in our group sort of two or three years ago where we built these stepped impedance filters uh, in, in order to just protect qubits. And so we sort of put some of these on all of our lines and, and you can see that we can get a couple orders of magnitude improvement in the lifetime of our qubits, which is great for quantum computing folks. Uh, we actually regularly ship wafers full of these things off to, to IBM so that they you know, put them around all of their uh, superconducting co quantum computer experiments to protect decay. Uh, but when we were doing that, we also noticed that there's actually some sort of interesting thing happening with the filter itself. And so instead of just putting these on the outside of a cavity QED experiment, we started putting qubits inside of them uh, and looking for these sort of photonic, band sta uh, photonic bound states that uh, Sajib John predicted in like the early 90s. So the idea is we create a band gap. So, the, so we take a transmission line. There's now no capacitors. This is sort of DC connected from end to end, and we just uh, modulate the impedance of this structure. And so we have one section that has a skinny center pin and a fat gap, and then one section that has a fat center pin and a skinny gap. Uh, and so if you modulate these sections, then from there you can build up uh, a gapped medium. Uh, and if you, if you pick the particularly lengths of the sections just right, uh, then you can build something where the qubit couples uh, uh, where you get a gap at the right frequency. Uh, and if you put a qubit in the middle, you can get it to cap couple to one band or the other. Uh, and in this case, we make a qubit that couples to the upper band of this system. So now we can use our, our local magnetic field to tune the qubit into and out of resonant, or sorry, into and out of the pass band of the system. So here blue is low transmission and red is high transmission. And so uh, what you see is you can see sort of the qubit uh, essentially couples to many of the modes in order to form this sort of exponentially decaying uh, localized photon state around itself sort of that looks like this. Uh, 
Um, and even when the qubit is actually in the passband, you sort of push a discrete state out of the passband and into the gap, uh, which is sort of a bound photon state. And by measuring the width of this line, you can actually extract how localized it is, because you can, you can understand that from how much it overlaps with uh, how much the tails of that photon state interact with the physical ends of the sample, because it's a finite size sample. Um, now, uh, you can do all kinds of fun things with this. So, so one thing is, is you can do this reservoir engineering. Uh, and so here, for instance, uh, we take our photonic bound state and we drive it. Uh, and when you drive it, you get these Mahler triplet states. Uh, and you can, again, uh, as we just heard in the last talk, push one of these across uh, the, the band edge. <coughs> and when it goes across the band edge, then uh, the decay rate for one state, uh, the, plus, the minus state is slow. The decay rate for the plus state is, is fast. Uh, and so you preferentially uh, prefer one, and so you, you sort of drive the system continuously into, uh, into the plus state uh, of the system. And so you prefer one state to the other, and so you can sort of see that you can drive the system into one state by pushing one of these across, uh, across the band edge. As you drive it across the band edge, you actually see another avoided crossing. So you sort of see an avoided crossing uh, when the qubit goes across the band edge, and this is sort of this state being pushed out of the, out of the band and into the gap. If you push the, the side band of this across the gap, you actually see a, another avoided crossing with, of the side band of this with the actual states in the gap. So it's sort of a dressed, uh, a, an avoided crossing of the dressed state with, uh, with the state in the band. So it's sort of a dressing of the dressed state as you go across that side. So you can sort of play some, some fun games there. One reason we, we really like this system is that it allows you to dynamically set up sort of interesting interacting photon lattices and photon-photon systems uh, because there's plenty of room in this picture here to add more qubits. Uh, and so if you add a second qubit to the system, what's going to happen? Well, you'll get a bound photon state around each qubit. Uh, these tails of these localized things will, will overlap, and this will lead to an interaction between these two uh, these two bound states. You have two single photon states, but there's some sort of interaction term between them. Uh, unlike if you have multiple qubits coupled to one cavity, which is essentially an infinite range uh, interaction, this is a nearest neighbor uh, interaction. Or it's, you know, depending on the, the, the size of these tails, it's sort of, uh, you know, exponentially localized to, to nearest neighbors. And so if you put n qubits in one of these uh, photonic band gap media, then you can set up uh, now sort of a, a nearest neighbor kind of model uh, where, where the, the parameters of this are tunable in situ. And in particular, as we tune the qubit frequencies closer and further from the band edge, the localization length changes, and that means that the overlap of these bound states changes, and so you can change the effective, uh, effective uh, lattice parameters in situ. Uh, and so we've done this. Uh, so here now is an avoided crossing where you tune one qubit or one single photon bound state past the other single photon bound states by controlling qubits which are sitting up in the pass band, but this is sort of looking at the states in the gap. Uh, and you see an avoided crossing because that's the sort of interaction of them. And you can see actually if we tune the two qubits, so now we have two qubits and we tune them down in frequency at, so they remain in resonance with each other. Uh, and as you get further and further from the band edge, so if you go down in frequency, you get further from the band edge, then the effective uh, interaction of these two bound states goes down because they get more localized and so they have less overlap with each other. And so as you move further or closer to the band edge, uh, you can get uh, this effective interaction rate between these two uh, neighboring bound states uh, tunable. Uh, and you know, we can tune it uh, over quite a bit. So here you can see it can be as large as a few hundred, uh, couple hundred megahertz. Uh, and you know, as we move it down and down and down, it gets down to sort of a few megahertz. Uh, and so we can tune uh, this effective uh, interaction rate between neighboring things uh, just, uh, just with our local applied magnetic fields. This is with two systems, but of course, uh, where we're going here uh, is, is to put in more than two, but, but a nice 1D lattice of, of, of these qubits in order to sort of control where our photons are and how much they, how much they overlap and interact with, with each other on sort of neighboring, on neighboring sites. So uh, just to give a quick uh, overview of the things we talked about, we're, we're really interested in this idea of many-body circuit QED and looking at sort of the various ways that you can try and probe non-equilibrium quantum physics by using photons as your sort of uh, 
uh, as the, the object that is interacting uh, and in, in, in sort of a whole handful of ways. So we have this dimer uh, where we looked at this dynamical phase transition. We have the 1D lattice where we look at this, uh, this, this steady state phase transition where we see this, this closing of the ADR. Uh, we, we have a scan probe tool to look at 2D lattices and some, uh, some lattices in curve space uh, and have been looking at these both multi-mode cavities where you see collective phenomena between the modes and now these 1D band gap materials where you see bound states and allow us to set up sort of interesting chains of bound states. And so this sort of gives you a whole gamut of the kinds of many body physics that we've been able to look at uh, or many, many cavity physics we've been able to look at uh, in our group using, using circuit QED. Yeah. Cubits. I'm a little, uh, I missed what the uh, two orders are. You said there's critical slowing down, so I guess that implies that there's some transition. Right. So, so, so we know there's a trans, so, okay. So we know that there are two very distinct states in steady state. And so, uh, and so the question is then, can you measure essentially what is the equivalent of the gap uh, between them? And I guess what my question uh, is, what are those, what are the order parameters? A fine question, and it's it's one that we don't super know. Uh, this is this is why we're really looking at these at these one. D so so what we've been able to measure is essentially what we can measure through transmission. Uh, we can measure photon number statistics. We can measure power. We can measure correlation functions. Uh, we really need to look at spatial information, which is one reason we've been pushing these spatial probes to actually understand uh, what is the what are the states. Uh, what we look at in terms of, of actually what we measure is we monitor A for, for sort of the average value of A for, for the system. And you can see that there's a sharp change in the average value of A. So that's what we're, we're sort of using. So what we don't know is what are the underlying states. But that's what we're using as our, our nominal order parameter. Yeah? So while we're looking at this slide, I wonder if you could go through and kind of tell us the number of excitations. Uh, because it seems like you're yeah. Right. So this is right. <laughs> right. So good question. Uh, so this uh, work here was uh, the the critical threshold for the the dynamical phase transition is uh, was about thirty photons. So this was many photons per lattice site. Uh, we sort of did that intentionally because there's it's sort of hard to extract a few different kinds of transitions you can get if you put the photon number low. We're now trying to do that more systematically. Uh, with this device that I flashed up, which allows us to actually tune the coupling between the cavities. Uh, and so we don't have to rely on power as our knob to tune sort of the ratio. And so there we're thinking we're going to see this, this actually at sub photon, so like single photon things. Here, uh, this, uh, this is, it really seems now to be a, a blockading effect. So we're pretty sure that this is sort of happening around the single photon or few photon level, um, though. Figuring out exactly how to calibrate is 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 really been a hard question in this. Uh, everything I showed, everything I showed is uh, in the two D world is linear, and everything we've done here is so far linear. So there's no interactions at all. Though uh, though, what are you going to see when you turn on interactions here? Uh, good question. Um, this is all uh, absolutely single photon physics, and so so we measure G two, we get we get uh, uh, anti bunching. Uh, it's really low power. Uh, this stuff uh, is, uh, it's, it's relatively high. It's sort of, again, tens of photons. Yeah. Please? You. Should I shoot you with a laser point? Should I point on you with a? Yeah, let me close my eyes. Now do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I pointed at you while you weren't looking. <laughs> um, so I, I have a question about the uh, lattices and curved space. Yes. <laughs> um, so basically, not really. I mean, so, so, so you need you can't you. There's no good block theory. So, so what what Alicia and Matthias have been doing uh, for the last month is reading this great thesis from uh, the math department from 1986 to try and understand how to develop a block theory for non-commuting generator groups. And so, it is not just you know simple like you you make block waves. Yes. Is 
the sensor. I could right. the length of all the connections and it would and it would look the same. Yes. If you could draw that plot centered on any point of the lattice and it would look the same as Mr. Mitchell, projecting it down to our world where there's just different like there's subtle things in the different hemisphere having to do with where people are. Yeah. Yeah, like trying to write down exactly where all the lattice points are. Uh, trying to come up with a, you know, it's non-commutative in terms of your generating vectors for it or your generating group for it. And so, uh, and then actually just writing down what group generates it is, is hard. And so you don't just have simple block theory, but, uh, but folks in math have thought about how to do block theory in some curve space lattices. And so now trying to sort of do that more generally and look at, you know, what are the interesting properties is, is what those guys have been doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only question I wanted um, about your, your training method for this thing is uh, so for this um, uh, array that you looked at that was a linear yeah. tool, and, and, and yet um, there is an array and, um, and you just look at that, but there seem to be uh, quite a bit of, of, of difference in some case between the generation and the. Yeah, so. so uh, it's a good it's a good question. I mean, I would uh, the, by most metrics the simulation looks looks pretty good. Uh, we think we have uh, on that one like we've gone back. We think we have one like if you look at it, it looks optically like there's one bad uh, one bad lattice site. So the fab just messed up in one of the 49 48 lattice sites, and so that sort of causes distortion. And, and it's centered on uh, centered on one peak over on the side. Do I have it here? Yeah, this guy over there uh, looked bad in retrospect uh, optically. And so it looked like we, we just had a fab defect there. Uh, and so that sort of causes the sort of waveforms to, or it causes the normal modes to shift around that. Um, but, you know, at least from a, from a, we fabricated a crazy thing and have a moving object above it, it seems to give at least the qualitative features pretty well. Um, I didn't show here, but we also, I said, can do this qubit so we can sort of start to also probe interesting photon number statistics with this sort of scanned pr qubit probe. Uh, there, we have to be even more careful about what, what we're actually doing because we sort of strongly couple a transmon to one of the lattice sites and we try to see what happens. Yeah. What's that? The tuning parameter is the initial photon number, or or the sort of steady state drive of the system, which maps onto the photon number. I hadn't expected that until you said those words. Um, I have to think about that more. I haven't thought about it. Yet. I mean, let's let's talk a little during the coffee breaks. I have to, yeah, I have to think about that some more. 